Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're here today with Michael Ashford, host of The Follow-Up Question, a podcast where he explores the psychology of conflict communication and what it means to have curious conversations that bring us together rather than divide us. Michael is a marketer, a former award-winning journalist, a two-time TEDx speaker, a communications coach, and his work across various platforms has been featured in publications like Men's Health Magazine and Podcast Magazine. You can learn more about all of his work at michaelashford.com. So, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Brian, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for inviting me on. Looking forward to the conversation, sir. Good, good. So um, what else would you like people to know about you? Oh, my gosh. Okay, that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, my family and I live in Colorado. It's, uh, it's getting to be summertime as we record this. So hiking season is here, which is one of my absolute favorite things to do to get away from it all and, uh, recenter myself out in nature. Um, you know, I think some people call it taking a bath in nature or, or nature bathing. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, I went to Can I went to Kansas State University, so I'm a I'm a Wildcat through and through. I, I love my college sports, in particular uh, college football, and yeah, I just uh, I I love 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 communication, hmm. effective communication. It is it is just uh, at this point in my life, my my life's pursuit professionally. Um, so I didn't touch on this much, but you know, can you talk about your career before you launched your own business? So yeah, I um I graduated like I said from Kansas State and I I went in as a I went to college as a civil engineering major. Mm, wow. Go, <laughs> go figure I ended up with a journalism degree. <laughs> <laughs> That's a switch. That is a switch. Um but yeah, I graduated with my journalism degree and went to work as the sports editor at the Emporia Gazette mm. in Emporia, Kansas. Oh good. Uh, about 20 20 to 25,000 people in, in Emporia, home of a division two university and several different high schools and schools around the, the area. And yeah, spent a couple of years there as the sports editor with a small team. And, um, that was some of the best years of my life in terms of, of my profession. Hmm. Um, because, you know, so many of us think of journalists as the people that we see on TV or the big names at the Washington Post or the New York Times. And we forget that there is a whole cadre of journalism practice practitioners across the United States working in small towns. Working unfortunately, in not as many as there used to be. Yeah, there's unfortunately not. Right, that's, I mean, that's really shrunk. It has, and it, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, the the advertising model that journalism was built on is falling apart with with the internet and journalists and newspapers especially at the local level were slow to catch up slow to catch up to that and gave away their product for free online for way too many years mm -hmm. uh, um but we, when i was when i was that that small town reporter i was i was not only charged with telling the stories of that small town but I was part of it as well. I lived in that community. I, my friends were there. I would write a story, and then the next day I'd see the, the person that I interviewed for that story at the barbecue joint or at the <laughs> coffee shop, you know? And we forget about that, mm -hmm. that these are people who have dedicated their life to truth-seeking, um, to telling stories, and doing it in such a way that they're, they're affecting the communities that they live yeah. in. Yeah. And I, man, that does, that gets lost, not just in journalism, but in communication as a whole. We we are mm -hmm. so focused on this large global issue or problem, mm -hmm. and we forget to think about the things that are right there in front of us, the things that we can control, the things that we can see and touch and and feel and and smell, <laughs> all the all the senses. We forget about that sometimes. So to go back to your question, I, I spent several years as a journalist before I got into, uh, I, I moved away from journalism once I met my wife. We wanted to have a family. The hours of a journalist and the pay are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got into the tech space and this, into the sales and marketing world and, and spent all this last 15 years as uh, a mar marketing leader at uh, 
technology companies, software companies. Which is really fun in and of itself too. I mean, having done oh that my myself. Gosh. I love it. I love it. And I, and I'm in no way, shape or form, like looking to leave or, or ditch that anytime soon. It's, uh, you know, the work that I do with my, my own site and my podcast, it's just kind of my, my side hustle, my, my very public hobby, <laughs> if you will. Uh, but I love building teams, scaling organizations, growing companies. It's, it's just so much fun to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, we kind of got in touch through my How to Heal Our Divides business, so, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But I also am launching something called um, Find Your Next Calling. And so I'm interested in, you know, asking you a few questions about that. Um, of course. One is kind of like, what made you branch out when you started your own freelance business in addition to or above and beyond your day job? I think it was always the pull back to journalism, to be quite honest, Brian. You know, while I left the journalism world and I no longer was a professional, quote unquote, journalist, I still had that itch within me. I still had that draw. You know, I was I was trained to be that after, like I said, moving away from civil engineering. And it really did strike a chord within my my soul, I'll say, Mm -hmm. telling people stories, asking questions, um, uh, approaching really hairy topics. Uh, from the mindset of a journalist who wants to seek truth, mm-hmm. whatever that truth may be, um, that never went away. Hmm. And so when the pandemic hit <laughs> and my wife and I are sitting out just outside this door uh, that you can't see on our couch watching the news one night, watching uh, the protests in the wake of the George Floyd murder mm-hmm. in the summer of 2020. And just thinking, for one, flipping back and forth between the different channels to see how they were reporting the protests and just looking at how different that was across even local channels. But then getting this sense like, I don't think this is who we are. Like, yes, this is a moment in time where where we are, emotions are high, understandably so. And, and we we seem to be at a tipping point where, where a lot of people are so frustrated that they don't know what to do. That's all very real, and I don't discount that. But the way to solve the issues and the problems is not setting fire to buildings and not showing up in military-grade vehicles <laughs> to meet violence with violence. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just had that feeling, and, and my, my journalistic instincts – popped up and said, I, I need to do the one thing that I think I can do really, really well in this situation. And that's ask people questions. Mm -hmm. And so I started my podcast. I started my website. Um, that led to my TEDx talks, which led to me helping other folks, um, craft their TEDx speeches and, and TEDx talks. And yeah, now I, I do some communication and speaking coaching on the side and, I love it. <laughs> I love it because my my approach to helping my approach to helping other folks craft their their talks or their their public presentations is very similar to what I do as a journalist. I interview them. <laughs> because we very rarely do we ever get asked deep questions about stuff that we really care about. <laughs> and that's what I bring to the table for my my clients. <laughs> very cool. So go back to when you were first starting, you know, your freelance business there. I'm sure you had to think about some choices of topic area to focus on, right? So you mentioned like some of the George Floyd things. So you could have focused, for instance, on social justice, you know, as a topical area, or Mm -hmm. you could have focused on sports since that was, you know, one of your earlier, you know, kind of careers, or, you know, you could have focused on like, healing divides and the social issues, you know, political issues and, and all kinds of different areas. Right. So, so how did you think about choosing amongst the landscape of who you want to interview and, and where you want to focus, you know, your work? I did what everyone tells you not to do, Brian. And I went really wide. <laughs> did you really? I, wow. I, yeah. I didn't focus too much at first. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll, I'll explain why I say at first. I just came at it with this idea that if we heard people's stories, 
if we heard really interesting stories from people that had stories to tell, and I believe that everyone has a story to tell, that within that search, within that um, exploration of people's stories, that we could come to find some semblance of common ground. The more we understand each other, the more we hear the the more we get beyond the cliches and like the social media posts of someone's life and get them to actually dive into the makeup of their experiences and how they came to their beliefs and their ideologies and and what's been true in their life that that they would have the perspective that they have i just had this theory that the more we the more i did that the more i talked to people from all walks of life and shared their stories, dug into those stories, we would see that we're more connected, we're more similar in a lot of ways than not, than I think a lot of us are feeling right now, mm -hmm. that we're all very different from the people that we see as other. Mm -hmm. What I found, Brian, is that that leading with that message of common ground and how to find it with people that you disagree with that's really hard to get people to pay attention to that huh. because at first blush, we don't want it. <laughs> we don't want it. It feels too dangerous. Yeah. It feels too vulnerable. It feels too exposing. It feels morally <clears throat> dissatisfying to say, I don't agree with that person. I don't like them. Why would I try to find common ground with them? So what I've done is I've backed it out a little bit more. And now I'm just trying to teach people, how do you communicate? Well, when disagreements do exist, huh. How do you bridge gaps? How do you uh, bridge ideological divides to co-create something better, to bring about action rather than just this bantering back and forth that never solves anything? I think in doing that, if I can teach you how to have conflict and do it constructively and communicate through that, I think it's a it's almost a Trojan horse way of introducing the concept of of common ground. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. When I launched How to Heal or Advise, I, I sent some of the same kind of pushback too. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people didn't want that. They don't want. They want to stay in their tribes, mm -hmm. right? You know, in their own ideological silo. So it's interesting that you you know perceive that as well. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating because. I, once people do get exposed to the intricacies and the nuance and the complexities of quote unquote, the other side, those barriers do come down, <laughs> but getting, getting them to that place where they're, they're ready to receive rather than always exert upon mm -hmm. that can be really, really challenging. Really, really. So um, what advice do you have for other people that are thinking about doing a freelance gig either on the side or as their main um vocation sure you know going back uh, a few years ago i was actually I, I you mentioned in my bio i was featured in men's health uh, that was for a, another side business that i had run for several years which was an online personal training um an online personal training business mm. uh, fitness fitness mm. coaching mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i i had built up you know my podcast through that, which was called the Fit Dad Fitness Podcast, which had achieved what everybody wants to achieve with their podcast, which is fully monetized, fully supported through um, advertisers and sponsors. It was the largest, longest running podcast in that space. And it was because I my business was called Fit Dad Fitness. Hmm. I did what hmm. I knew really well and that I did well, which was speak to my audience, which was fathers who wanted a no nonsense way to approach their fitness to get mm. away from to get away from all the 22 year old fitness bros telling them no excuses and just do it <laughs> um something that you know uh, a 35 year old 40 year old father of two we've got excuses of course we've got excuses <laughs> we've got we've got commitments and and things that we have to do that can pull us away from the gym. So we know we can't spend tw two hours a day, every day at the gym. That's just not feasible. So how do we have a no nonsense approach to our fitness? That's, and so I, I mentioned with the follow-up question, I did what probably is not the advice, which was go wide, narrow in on an audience, speak to a specific pro uh, problem that that audience has and do what you do really well. You know, I, I 
I started the follow-up question with that journalistic intent because after a lot of trial and error, Brian, I interview people really well. And that is not an ego thing. That is just something that I have put a lot of work into making uh -huh. sure that uh, I used to be terrible. I used to be horrible when I made that switch from civil engineering to journalism. I was a terrible interviewer, but I worked really, really hard at it. Mm. And it's one of the things, it's what I know how to do best at this point. Mm. And so do something that you do well, not always something that you love to do. Um, that, that could, there can be some mix up in there. You know, the, the follow your passion um, advice that's out there can sometimes get you into trouble. Um, if, if you're not careful, mm -hmm. but yeah, find an audience, speak to their problem and do what you do. Approach that problem with what you do really well, if that makes sense. Sure. Sure. So one more question kind of on the freelance gig aspect. Yeah. 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 Um, how do you balance between your day job, your freelance work, your family, other commitments I'm sure you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, my answer may be unsatisfactory to, to some people. <laughs> I, I have an intense amount of energy, Brian, and this is how I get it all out. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I am blessed to have an employer that is supportive and understands that this is, this is, this is my hobby um, in, in effect. So what you see publicly from me is not me trying to like go and circumvent my job, but it is just the things that I enjoy doing. This is my hobby. Podcasting and helping people, coaching people um, is, is something that I really, really enjoy doing. And it just happens to be very public in nature. It would be uh -huh. no different than if I spent, you know, every waking moment out on a golf course. <laughs> you know, after, after work, I would go to, I would go golf for, you know, three hours, perhaps. Same idea. I just happen to do, <laughs> do mine very publicly. Um, I get up early. I exercise. I think that contributes to my energy. Um, I work on one thing at a time, so I'm efficient in that. If I have, I get my, my full-time job when I'm there, I'm there, I'm in it, I get that work done. And that gives me time outside of those hours to, to do the, the other things, mm -hmm. to cook, mm -hmm. to go on hiking, to, you know, have fun with the family, uh, to involve them in those things that I enjoy as well. You know, I don't just go on hikes by myself all the time. I bring the family along so that we can spend that time together. And yeah, I just, I love it. So I work really, really hard at it. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> so let's go back to your podcast. Um, you, you describe it as exploring the psychology of conflict communication. What does that mean? Well, as I described earlier, after I had done quite a few interviews and let's say that it you know probably happened around interview 60 or 70 of the show and now we're in the hundreds a lot of patterns started to come up in the interviews that I was doing and you know understandably when it, when you're talking about finding common ground a lot of the a lot of the issues tend to trend political for sure so I was I was having a lot of these political interviews a lot of left right conversations um, a lot of social issues um, from, from a diverse background of people. But no matter where these folks stood on the political spectrum or in regards to whatever political or social issue that we were talking about, the same types of patterns started to repeat themselves. And one of the things that I'm very interested in is what happens in that moment of self-reflection or what gets someone to the moment of self-reflection where they begin to deeply question themselves internally not that they're not that they believe that they are wrong and not saying that anybody is wrong for their their deeply held beliefs but i find it fascinating when someone gets to the level of comfort with themselves and what they believe that they begin to question themselves and how they came to those beliefs and and who influenced those beliefs mm -hmm. one of the questions i ask is the first time you ever stated your political beliefs and I can think back to probably I'm, I'm 13, 14 years old the first time that happened to me. Whose beliefs was it? Was it your own <laughs> or was that influenced by your mom, your dad, your grandfather, your, your teachers? Like whose beliefs were those? 
Like, let's explore that a little bit more. And out of those moments of self-reflection, I noticed this pattern happening with people who were best equipped and most able to have really deeply uncomfortable conversations. It started with that moment of self-reflection where they began to question their own beliefs. Mm. Again, not saying that they're wrong. They just questioned them. They asked questions of themselves. Then in doing that, they start to get curious about others. And they start to ask questions about others. They're still in their minds. But all, all of a sudden, they're like, well, if that's my belief, if that's how I came to my conclusions about this issue, why does that person believe differently than me? What in the world could be true in their life that they would think so drastically different than me? We even maybe grew up in the same family, and they think this way, and I think this way. Why? Mm. And then we follow that curiosity to go ask questions of others, to take that vulnerability, to take that, that self-reflection and introspection that we've done on ourselves and about others and go seek out answers to those questions about what may be true for someone else. And that is setting aside this massive ego that we all have, that we are correct and right and that we came to our beliefs nobly and, and in the, the good way, <laughs> setting that aside to go and we come up with this question of, if there are things that I could be wrong about, I want to know what those are. And so I go and That's seek a very out. important thing for people to ask, isn't yeah. it? Because that admits that you don't know everything. Yeah, yeah. And none of us do. Of course. <laughs> so that's what I, that's the process that I call the psycho. That's the the stakes of what I call the psychology of conflict communication. That you go through this process of questioning yourself, asking questions about others, and then finally going asking questions of others, so that you get a fuller picture to actually solve the problem, to co-create a new solution to a problem that may have never existed before. And when you say solve the problem, I mean, is that referring to making changes in your own life? How, how do you view that? It could be. It could be. You know, one of the questions that I love asking that I'm exploring in the book that I'm writing right now, asking the question, do you believe people can change, tells me so much about you as a person and your willingness to step into vulnerability and discomfort. Because if I ask that question of you, Brian, do you believe people can change? If your answer is no, people cannot change. How are you going to approach conflict? <laughs> You're going to try and force people. With a hammer. <laughs> You're going to try and bring out the hammer. Exactly. And what do we see happening over and over and over again these days over important, big, hairy, complex, nuanced issues? People bringing out the hammer to try and force change upon others. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is anyone that I have ever asked that question of, do you believe people can change? A hundred percent of the time, people tell me that, yes, they believe people can change. <laughs> In fact, I get answers like, um, I believe it is a human right to ch change. I believe that it is our responsibility as humans to change. So there's a deep, deep yearning of the heart when it comes to our, our belief that people can change. So if you believe people can change, then you got to start asking the questions of why and how. Why do people change? And what does it look like? Well, it's not going to be because someone forced them to with the hammer that you just mentioned, Brian. But it's going to be because they were given the space by someone else who got curious about their life. They were given the space to deeply examine the issue at hand and do it in a way that that they were vulnerable yet not attacked, um, that they were able to explore some really deep nuanced recesses of their mind and soul perhaps even to uncover what it is that they truly believe. And when you're given that space, then you eventually come to moments of change on your own. <laughs> not because anybody forced you to, right. right? because someone created the space for you to. And that's very that's a very different place to come at approaching change. 
So I love this book that was written a couple decades ago now. Car- Carol Dwork, I think it's called Mindset. Mindset. And, you know, it basically is kind of the academics behind a growth versus a fixed mindset. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of the impact that has on people's lives, the attitudes that it drives them to take, um, and a lot of the different kinds of things that you were talking about. Uh, I found that to be very helpful on that. I'll have to look it up. I love reading books. <laughs> so um, since you've done so much interviewing, what what would you say would be like one of the worst questions that you ever asked someone? <laughs> <laughs> one of the worst questions that I ever asked. So I mentioned earlier that when I first got into journalism, I was uh, not a good interviewer. I would not listen. I wouldn't really ask follow-up questions. I would write down my questions uh, beforehand to the T and I would never deviate from them whatsoever. So this happened at a Kansas state football press conference. I was doing a story on one of the student athletes for Kansas state. He was a a high level, uh, all conference tight end for the football team. He was also an academic all American and he was a husband and a father. So he, he had a full plate. Yeah. Yeah. Full plate. Well, somewhere in my research and in my notes, I had written down that his wife was pregnant with their second child. So I start the interview with Brian and I have my notes in hand, my little reporter's notebook, and I get to the question. So how do you think life is going to change with baby number two on the way? (laughs) He he looked at me, uh, his eyes got real wide. Um, He he was, he was quiet for a second. You can kind of see his face then start to scrunch as he processed my words. And he's like, "Uh, do you know something? I don't. (laughs) And Brian, like my world just like sank oh, in on man. me. I could not, I could not get out of that fast enough. But uh, needless to say, his wife was not pregnant with his second child. <laughs> I don't know where I got that information. <laughs> Through artificial it, intelligence, right? It was a whole Yeah, <laughs> this was years before AI came, came along. <laughs> but oh my gosh, um, I say it's the worst question that I ever asked. Not because, I mean, it was harmless in the grand scheme of things. And I wrote the story and it was, it, it, the story turned out really well. But it was, it was an illustration of just like how assumptions can go awry. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that was the question that forced me to be a better interviewer, to mm-hmm. really work on my interviewing because I, I was so embarrassed. I had made assumptions. I had gone in thinking I already knew the answer to that interview and to that question. I was kind of just asking questions to fill in the gaps in the same way that these days, a lot of us ask questions as weapons to make our point Mm -hmm. rather than to actually be curious about someone else. That, that question, I love it now. I love the example that it gives, Uh, you know, it's a lighthearted example of, of just when we go in thinking we know the answer, we can get real burned. <laughs> so on the other side, what about the best question that you've ever asked? Oh, one of my favorite questions that I ever asked. So there is a, a voice coach, a Hollywood voice coach. Her name is Denise Woods. And she wrote a book called The Power of Voice. And it's all about how to use your voice to overcome your your internal trauma, Mm -hmm. um, how to, how to actually speak clearly and with authority and confidently using your voice. And so she wrote this, this great book. I loved it. It was, it was fascinating read, you know, had exercises on, on voice lessons that you can do that I still perform to this day, right before I get on a podcast like this one, but stuck about three quarters of the way through the book just two paragraphs she threw in a couple a couple sentences here and there about listening Mm. and about how important listening is to dialogue and to the eventual projection of your voice and it was such a stray from the rest of the book that Mm. it made it was one of those moments that made me stop and go why did she put this in there (laughs) Because when I'm an interviewer and when I'm interviewing people, I'm constantly looking for patterns and anomalies. And this was a huge anomaly to me in this book that was all about using your voice. Now all of a sudden she's talking about listening. So I asked her that question. I said, Denise, in a book about using your voice and coming to find your confidence through your voice, why did you throw in 
seemingly at random, a few paragraphs about the power of listening. And she started to cry. And she said, thank you for seeing that. Thank you for noticing that. Mm -hmm. And here's why. And she started explaining why she put that in there and why it was so deeply important mm -hmm. for her to throw that in there. Uh -huh. But those, a question like that, and that's just one example. I've had many of those over the course of my, my interviewing career where you begin to truly see someone for who they are. Mm -hmm. And that question, her response, thank you for seeing that. <laughs> I, Brian, that just, that underscores the importance of asking a question, like yes. one that you truly want to know the answer to. Uh -huh. It's, it's those examples that I turn back That's to. Great. I love that one. I love that one. Yeah. So, um, you know, the whole media world and journalism is, um, <laughs> what do I want to say? Um, not necessarily universally viewed positively. <laughs> right. <laughs> is that what, is that a polite way to say it? Um, uh -huh. About as polite as you could get it. Yes. Uh, what, what advice do you have for um, for that industry to help things? You know, Brian, I I've voiced some of this before, and some of my journalism friends don't like it, but I I, um, I really believe that we're in just in a different time. Um, no one, even when I was in college, could have foreseen the changes that have happened in in our social structures that the internet and social media have brought to things. Um, when, when phrases like alternative facts <laughs> have actually crossed someone's lips, yeah. um, when, when your truth becomes capital T truth, like the truth, and we each can have our own version of it, changes have to be made. So things that I think about in terms of how journalism needs to change, I would love to see, I would love to see, um, political endorsements from newspapers stop. Hmm. I know that has been a healthy part of our democracy for many, many years. Um, I don't know that it, I don't know that it serves the purpose that it used to anymore. It is, it is seen with, um, it is seen as a, as a, as a very biased thing. And quite honestly, it is uh, for, for an entire news organization to, politically endorse a candidate that it is supposed to be reporting on the good and the bad there's some issues mm -hmm. with that. conflict of interest absolutely it's simple in the same way i would have publishers and reporters no longer allowed to publish op-eds opinion pieces i think if you're a reporter go report i think if you're an opinion writer that's what you're paid to do. You you write. And I don't believe that the publisher of a newspaper should write opinion pieces either. Hmm. Um, that's that's a common practice, especially in the smaller newspapers. And by smaller, I mean, you know, my hometown newspaper, the Kansas City Star, <laughs> um, where I live now in the, Den in the Denver, Colorado area, the Denver Post. Just think they should get away from op-eds. Again, conflict of interest. I would also like to see reporters be more transparent in how they came to their information. We've seen a lot over the last probably, I'll say, eight years, a lot of usage of um, anonymous sources to, again, ask uh, to, to drive home stories that I think they already kind of knew how, what they wanted to write. And so they just needed to find a source, any source, even if it was anonymous, to corroborate that story that they wanted to write, and they being the reporter. I was taught in journalism school the the use of an anonymous source is the absolute last thing that you should do um it again it erodes public trust mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you throw out an anonymous source so i would i would have reporters actually post full um full recordings of all of their interviews so people can hear the entire interview so that they can see if whether or not a quote was taken out of context or not um that that a reporter wasn't mixing and mashing different quotes to make it seem like the, the interviewer, I know reporters do this, to make it seem like the, the subject said something that either went against or for the story that they were reporting on. Just more transparency about how you came to your information as a reporter. And then, uh, you know, the last kind of thing that I, I the last sticking point that I, I often touch on is I would stop calling TV news casters um news 
you know, the news programs, I would stop calling them journalists. Um, they're entertainers. They're not journalists. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, I know the like channel nine news, the NBC affiliate here in, in Colorado. Uh, I know the, the hosts of those, you know, the five o'clock news, the six o'clock news, um, they do some reporting on their own. There's a lot of opinion thrown into it, but more than anything, they're there to, they're there to read the news, not actually report the news. Mm -hmm. They're entertainers, they're hosts. And so we need to have more of a dividing line about the journalists doing the actual work in the trenches mm -hmm. and the folks delivering that news to us. There's, there's a blend or a mix or a graying of the lines there that I think we need to we need to be a little bit better about um, drawing more of a hard line there. So those are just some of the ideas that I. So have. those are all great ideas, but they're all driven in my mind by the goal of trying to do the right thing. Yeah, and media is not the only industry in the world that's driven by money, not by trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's simple. Plain and simple. So ratings, yeah. right, you know, is what drives money. Right. Um, so how do you change behavior mm -hmm. like that that's so driven, whether it's by donors for politicians or by ratings for, you know, media? Um, you know, you got something fundamentally underlying, you know, all of that, whether it's um, – you know, change in people's attitudes so the ratings go down for the outlets that are blatant, you know, or we change laws so politicians can't get, you know, huge donations by corporations that are supposedly, you know, mm -hmm. people. Yeah. <laughs> the most ridiculous rulings I've ever heard in my life. But in any event, um, <laughs> what, what, what suggestions do you have about solving some of these underlying macro problems that prevent doing the right thing? Honestly, Brian, I don't know. You're talking about you're talking about fixing uh, the money problem of journalism, and that's been a problem for a long time. Is how do you separate the financial interests of either advertisers or you know a, a big thing these days is um, philanthropists getting involved in media and and um, being the financial backers for a media outlet or media sure. organization. Uh, yeah, uh, there's, there's talk of government funding for newspapers and doing away with the advertising model. I don't know, you know, there, unless, unless it is a fully subscriber supported model, a lot of different issues fall, a lot of different, um, ways to solve that fall apart in my mind. But even if it's subscriber supported, that just rewards me for being tribal. Right, right. You know, you're gonna I, go I, where I'm they say to my tribe. Thing. I'm just gonna get them to pump money, and you know, I know. I don't know if subscriber, you know, is the right. I don't, <laughs> I don't pretend to have the right answer either. Yeah, but you're closer to this industry than I am, so I wanted to ask you about that. I, I am. So there's a there's a secondary outlet here in the Colorado, uh, in the Denver, Colorado, Colorado area called the Colorado Sun, and it is it is kind of philanthropic grant subscriber funded no advertising from at least from what i can tell um where the model is you can get all of their content for free but if you want to support good journalism mm -hmm. and transparent journalism they do a lot of the things that I've, i discussed earlier then this is the out this is the news outlet for you and they have gained substantial market share over for instance the denver post which is a private equity backed or a private equity held newspaper outlet right now here in the Denver area, uh, Denver, Colorado area. And I like that model more. It has its flaws and I don't know if it is the end all be all for everyone. Um, I also look at a new news organization like Axios mm -hmm. that again, it's a free and open model. They've got some, some, advertising backing and some some uh, venture capital backing invested in it but i like that they take the narrative out of it 
And if you go to an Axios story, it is it is like bullet points of information rather than the full narrative. That's interesting. That's an interesting way to do it, too. Are you familiar um, with the 1440? The daily email <laughs> newsletter that's kind of getting a lot of um, credit in the same vein as what you're describing for Axios. Yeah, being, I, I have heard of it. I've not subscribed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, I also think it's interesting to go to uh, publications in, like in the UK and see how they're yeah they're yeah. Reporting on us. <laughs> yeah absolutely I think it's it's valuable to have you know outside of eyes and ears you know that yeah. are not as well whatever yeah <laughs> so <laughs> all right long answer I mean I've got a lot of ideas and thoughts but ah, your well, guess is as good as mine huge, huge thorny issues right you know that have a monumental effect on our society and, and you know and seem to be so intractable. Many. So right. important, but you know, I mean, we got to deal with it. <laughs> yes, we do. You know, uh, even if it's just gradually eating away at the margins, but um, we, yep. we've gone too far, you know, the polarization and all the problems that you know we've created by a variety of different um forms of greed, honestly. <laughs> no <laughs> argument for me out of that. <laughs> well, Michael, I really appreciate you joining us and uh, congratulations on uh, your podcast and all Thank of the other fantastic work that you're doing. Um, maybe I, I, could you tell us a little bit more about your new book? You mentioned that you're working on a book. Yes, sir. Uh, I am, I'm hopeful to get it out this fall, the fall of 2023. It is called, can I ask a question? Appropriately. <laughs> go. Good. And uh, it's diving into a little bit what we talked about earlier, the psychology of conflict communication, walking you through that process of, of what it looks like in practice to ask questions of yourself, ask questions about others, and ask questions of others, all in a pursuit of, of this, this question of how do, how do we bring about change and why? Why do we want to bring about change? And I'll kind of give you a little bit of a sneak peek into the, the answer there, which is I believe we all want, I, I believe we want peace. And this is what my second mm. TEDx talk was about, being a peacemaker versus a peacekeeper. Hmm. we all want peace in our lives. However, we define that there's, there's this drive and this desire to want peace. Now, whether that peace is contrived and, um, cut off from the rest of the world through isolating yourself from things that are difficult, like a peacekeeper might do, or whether that peace is real, where you lean into uncomfortable situations and conversations because you know that pushing through it actually creates real peace. That's a peacemaker's mentality. And so that I believe is, is why we want to do all this stuff. Why do we want to learn and understand the psychology of conflict communication and understand why people change so we can actually have some real stinking peace in mm. our lives. Mm. Very cool. Well, um, let's circle back when the book is uh, about to launch. Yes, we'll do another interview specifically around that. Wonderful. I look forward to it, sir. Yeah, well, Michael, thanks again. It's been a great conversation. Um, please check out Michael's website, michaelashford.com, and you can learn more and keep track of all the great things that Michael's doing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian.